Bacon uh, Center. Uh, I want to give special thanks uh, to the center's faculty director, Wendy Parmet, uh, who is just back from speaking at a conference at American University uh, on the public health implications of potential changes to our healthcare system. Wendy's new book, The Health of Newcomers, written with Northeastern Professor of Philosophy, Patricia Illingworth, recently published by NYU Press, makes a compelling case of extending solidarity by providing health care to those who have reached our shores is both a smart and a humane thing to do. Thanks also to the center's new managing director, uh, Jennifer Hewer, uh, who came to us roughly a year ago from the Massachusetts Health Policy Commission after having also earned her LLM in health policy and law here at Northeastern. Uh, her energy and insight have enabled us to expand our programming and let the world know the exciting work being done here, battling the opioid crisis, fighting for access to medicines, securing workplace safety, rethinking policies on organ donation, protecting reproductive freedom, fighting tobacco, uh, and ensuring quality and efficiency of innovations such as employer wellness program. Uh, welcome also to Dr. Gregory Kirkland, who I see you just walked in, uh, the Center's new research and publications director and physician scholar uh, who joined us this year after spending last year at Yale Law School. Uh, Dr. Kirkman served for nearly three decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and also joining us as a fellow in the center this year is Elizabeth Ryan, uh, who under the auspices of the George Consortium is now writing a fabulous blog called Public Health Law Watch. I urge you all to subscribe. Uh, every year our center takes great pride in hosting a distinguished speaker who has found ways to improve public health through advocacy, teaching, uh, or scholarship. Our recent speakers have included NYU Professor Sylvia Law, Massachusetts Public Health Commissioner Monica valdez Lupi, uh, head of the American Health Law Association, Lois Cornell, uh, and internet scholar Nicholas Carr. Uh, this year, uh, the distinction of our uh, speaker uh, is um, second to none. Uh, Stephen Rosenfeld is uh, a retired partner uh, at Rosenfeld, Rafik, and Sullivan. Uh, he's a specialist in health access uh, and health benefits law. Uh, he's litigated in pretty much every court uh, in the country, including the United States uh, Supreme Court, uh, often representing individuals uh, who are denied uh, insurance coverage uh, for their health care. He's also brought class actions on behalf of large groups of people who have been denied health-related benefits. Uh, he's had a long and distinguished career, including serving as chief of staff uh, to the uh, Governor Dukakis of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, working in the AG's office here uh, and running the uh, Government Bureau. He's also taught law school at NYU uh, here at Northeastern uh, and at Boston uh, College uh, Law School. Uh, he's a magna cum laude graduate from Harvard Law School uh, and uh, did his undergraduate work uh, at Brown. Uh, but not only has uh, uh, Mr. Rosenfeld been uh, a prodigious uh, litigator and government servant, servant uh, he's also been active in many, many uh, not-for-profit uh, organizations. Uh, he was the founder of Health Law Advocates, a not-for-profit public interest law firm dedicated to gaining access to health care for vulnerable populations uh, in Massachusetts. He served for many years as a board member of Health Care for All, a grassroots uh, health policy organization. Um, and he was uh, a member and chair of the National Alliance on Mental Illness uh, of Massachusetts, uh, finishing uh, his chair just uh, a three-year term as chair uh, just in uh, 2016. Uh, he also found time to have four children and three grandchildren, uh, and is uh, married to uh, Marco Hotsford, a graduate of our law school uh, and associate justice at the Supreme Judicial Court. Uh, Mr. Roosevelt, we are delighted to be here today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here, and uh, um, you know, I, I was invited uh, by somebody I can't say no to uh, six months ago, and that's Wendy Parmet, and she I know is the head of uh, uh, this institute, but she's also been a longtime colleague of mine. We're going to talk a little bit about it today, and the work that we have done uh, together, uh, and it's been great. Uh, she's been a, a great co-counsel and uh, co-founder because yes, I I started a Health Law Advocates. Uh, uh, in 1996, along with a number of other people. Wendy was right there uh, with me when we started uh, that organization. So what I thought I would uh, try to do today is to talk about um, health policy, health law, and how the two interplay. And I, I, I really feel privileged that over the years that uh, I've been what uh, I finally was willing to call uh, myself a healthcare lawyer, um, after all of these years has really allowed me uh, just a, a great um, a kind of insight into uh, how these two aspects of, uh, 
of the important activity on the part of lawyers and others play together. And when I talk about health, uh, I'm, I'm just going to talk in really pretty general terms about these, uh, not to get too, too, uh, 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 too, too minute about it. Uh, when I think about health policy, I'm really talking about uh, uh, rules of general application, anything that applies to broadly um, that, uh, that uh, involves uh, health care. It can be health policy, and it can be made in a number of different ways, typically through legislation, but in a lot of other ways as well as I'll, I'll point out. And then health law, when I think about uh, lawyering and health law, I think about uh, representing particular people. So it's the other end of the spectrum. Broad general uh, policy, health policy, representing individuals or groups of individuals, uh, you know, is what I refer to as the, the health law part of uh, the work uh, that we do. And uh, I, you know, I, I really came at this and I want to talk about actually health law advocates and a number of the cases that we've done and what they reveal about this interplay between uh, health policy on the one hand and health lawyering, health care lawyering on the, uh, on the other. And I was uh, kind of uh, lucky to come to this uh, uh, relatively late in my career I, I, because as, uh, as the dean said, you know, I had a number of things I did uh, before I started working on uh, health law and, uh, and, and all of those, uh, attorney general's office, teaching law, uh, and uh, <clears throat> legal counsel uh, to the governor. You know, I had the reputation of being a quick study, that is, learn quickly and then put it to work. Uh, and in my 50s, in the early 90s, I came to realize that that isn't necessarily such a good thing. Uh, that being a quick study means you know a lot, a little bit about a lot of things, but not a whole lot about any one thing. And so in my, in, in, in my 50s and in the 1990s, I decided I really needed to focus. And, uh, and I spent a couple of years figuring out what that might be, and it, I decided uh, that, uh, that healthcare is really where I wanted to go. Uh, and I started uh, volunteering at an organization called Healthcare for All in, uh, in 1993 in an effort to get good at one thing. And that was 24 years ago. Uh, and, uh, and that's what I've done for the, for the past uh, 24 years. So now I'm, I'm, uh, I'm no longer a quick study. I'm a slow study. Uh, and uh, and I, I feel very, very happy to have taken that turn. Uh, so I, I just, you know, it, it's interesting. I want to tell you about what Healthcare for All is and then talk about health law advocates. Healthcare for All is an advocacy organization here in Boston. It's the leading grassroots health advocacy organization, state-based health advocacy <coughs> organization in the country. It has that reputation. It's been around for 32 years now. Uh, and it was already at least 10 years in existence. I can't do the math right now. Uh, when I came to it as a volunteer in 1993, uh, and uh, I thought, well, here's a place. And I wasn't sure at the time what it was about healthcare that I wanted to uh, specialize in. And it, I was open because uh, for the past uh, several years, I'd really been done more policy than law. For example, I was uh, chief of staff to the governor. There was no law practice at all involved in that. <coughs> and so I just wanted to get a handle on some aspect of health care because I thought it was really important. It was at the time uh, uh, Bill Clinton had just been elected and had made a uh, passage of health reform a first priority and Hillary Clinton was the, kind of the quarterback of that. So I thought, mm, this is a really good time to get involved because health reform is about to happen. <laughs> 15 years, <laughs> but I stayed with it and decided not to change uh, my commitment based on the failure of uh, health reform in 93, 94. So, so, uh, so there I was, and I, I, I came to Healthcare for All thinking, which by the way is not a, a legal organization, it is an advocacy organization that advocates for policy changes. It's all about policy. And in fact, uh, fast forward, uh, uh, 13 years, it really was healthcare for all that led the charge for health reform here in Massachusetts, which in turn uh, led to the passage of national health reform, the ACA. But it really started here in Massachusetts with Chapter 58 
uh, of the acts of 2006, and healthcare for all was really the prime mover. There were a lot of other organizations and a lot of other heroes, but uh, healthcare for all was the, was the prime mover. So I went there in 1993 uh, with the idea that, um, that I would find a place. And so I started volunteering. And I, it became very clear very quickly that in order to, uh, to master policy, it would take more years than I had left in my life. And there were already were so many people at Healthcare for All who knew so much about health policy. But then I realized one big thing. There was no other lawyer at Healthcare for All. I was the only person who was volunteering in the office every day. And so what I brought to the table as a lawyer were some skills, some knowledge, some experience uh, that didn't otherwise exist. And I immediately saw, and others saw, that that was useful. That was value added. It was the way that I could add value as a lawyer to uh, this, uh, um, this uh, very active and, uh, um, and uh, determined organization committed to healthcare. So I started uh, to talk to people about the issues they were facing and to, to, to see if I could add an element. And uh, what came of that is in 1994, uh, we had a conference. Uh, I sent out letters to people who considered themselves healthcare lawyers, or I thought were healthcare lawyers, and there were very few. This is on the plaintiff's side. This is on the reform side. This is on the movement side. Uh, and Wendy was there, it was June 1994. We had a conference, and I think there were about 20 lawyers. And it was health law, uh, uh, health law advocacy brought, uh, broadly defined. And uh, it was the first time people had come together, actually swap stories, talk shop about what they were doing on, on, on that large basis. And so we decided, okay, let's stay together. Let's figure out how we can help one another. We actually started a newsletter. And Wendy was the editor of that first uh, newsletter, which I think came out in either late 94 or early 95. And then we got the idea, okay, well, maybe if we're together, we can actually work on cases together. And we started something called the uh, Healthcare for All Legal Network, uh, where many of us who were in practice, because I had started my own law firm at that time, to do only health law at that time in order to try to immerse myself completely. And so we uh, started taking uh, individual cases. Um, and we th that was a wonderful experience. And that led to, in turn, in 1996, uh, the founding of Health Law Advocates. And Health Law Advocates, so now is, uh, what does that make us? 21 years old, 22 years old. Uh, the executive director of Health Law Advocates, Matt Selig, is here. Wendy is a, a member of the board. Any other members of the board here? Oh, Dan, right. Dan Jackson, former chair of the, uh, of the board. Wendy, former chair of the board. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and in that time, we've grown from one half of one person, uh, health law advocates, to now a staff of 15. 15. And, uh, and it's a, so it's a health care public interest law firm. Uh, and uh, really, it's the only one like it in the country. People would say, well, gee, we should replicate it in other states, and we've, we've just decided to try to do our thing as well as we can, and if others want to try it, fine. Other number of others, uh, people in other states have tried, and somehow just didn't, uh, didn't take hold. So that was Health Law Advocates in 96. And now let me go back and say that when, um, when I started working uh, on health care, uh, I came to realize in about a year that the most important law uh, in the world of health care is actually ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of, uh, uh, of 1974. I had never heard of it. I can remember that in 1994, I realized, yeah, I didn't know something about ERISA, because that seems to be really important here. And I went to Wendy, I came right to, uh, to her to her faculty office here and said, Wendy, what's, what's ERISA all about? And so uh, Wendy was my tutor uh, early on in learning uh, about healthcare, enough so that I actually taught health law 
in, uh, in 1994 at Boston College, trying to stay one week ahead of the students. <laughs> I'm sure nobody here ever does that. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and so I, I realized I had to get to know uh, uh, Rissa. Why did I have to do that? When we started Health Law Advocates, we tried not to duplicate what others were already doing. There's, you know, there were legal services lawyers who did health care involving Medicaid, Mass Health in Massachusetts, and Medicare and public programs. Uh, so, so we would have been reinventing the wheel to try to master uh, Medicaid and Medicare and other public programs. But what was also true is that the majority of people in this state and nationally don't rely on public programs for their health care. They get their health care through their workplace. Uh, and uh, when they need health care, um, they are going to rely on their employ the insurance company that's been chosen by their employer, a private commercial insurance company. So, so uh, and, and therein lies the importance of ERISA, because uh, the employee, the, the uh, E-R-I-S-A, ERISA, governs uh, the management of and the enforcement of uh, private uh, workplace insurance, including health insurance. It's a, a you know, it's a benefit uh, of, uh, of employment and uh, the law was passed to protect workers from, and this originally in pension, in the world of pensions, from having their uh, benefits essentially robbed from them by uh, uh, malfeasance by employers. Uh, but what had happened, and this is uh, 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 the first of uh, uh, a number of points I want to make about uh, health care, the interplay of policy and law, what had happened is this law, the ERISA law, in the, in the years between 1974, when it was passed, and the mid-90s, had really been captured by the defendant's bar, by the, uh, defen uh, the defense bar representing uh, private corporations. So that a very vaguely worded law, which, had, uh, uh, which was passed ostensibly for the benefit of, uh, of employees, had actually become an impediment. Uh, to the protection uh, of employees. Uh, so, for example, um, there were no jury trials in cases where uh, claimants were suing their insurance company for denying them coverage or for cancellation of coverage because uh, defendants had persuaded courts all the way up to the Supreme Court. This was an equity action, so, 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 so jury trials weren't available. Really, no trials at all. Because they also the, the, the defendants bar um, uh, convinced the courts that this that that what was going on in court was really uh, uh, very similar to the judicial review of the administrative action of an administrative agency, and that the internal review that happened inside the insurance company was like close enough <coughs> to the action of an administrative agency that really the job of the court was simply to make sure that no abuse of discretion had taken place. So the standard of review was abuse of discretion uh, rather than an independent review of what had gone on. Uh, so in this and other ways, essentially, the courts were re relegated uh, to a marginal status in terms of being able to uh, give relief to people who were denied uh, coverage by the insurance companies that had been chosen by their employers. Uh, and it was essentially a shutout situation when we met it, when we met the, uh, the world of ERISA in 1994, 1995, 1996. And what, to make matters worse here in Massachusetts, the First Circuit was deemed the worst of the circuits in so far as protecting workers' rights under the ERISA law was concerned. <coughs> So that's what we faced. Remember, we had taken on, uh, decided to take on the, the protection of people who had jobs, couldn't afford lawyers other, otherwise, but had jobs and uh, were finding themselves denied the coverage they needed at the time they needed it most. The way we did this is when we formed Health Law Advocates, whereas um, uh, legal services 
has a 100% or there, thereabouts of the federal poverty level as the ceiling of the people they represent, we said, no, we're going to go higher because these are, uh, our role is to protect those up to a, and we, it was fairly arbitrary when we picked it, uh, up to a ceiling of 300% of the federal poverty line. We're going to represent those folks who were all working, couldn't afford a lawyer, had private insurance through their workplace, and were being denied coverage, particularly those who were participating in health maintenance organizations, HMOs. In the 90s, at the time we, were doing, we started doing this, the HMOs had a reputation, a well-deserved reputation of denying care wherever possible. Because HMOs are, dri are, are driven, uh, th th they, they, they achieve surpluses if they take in less money uh, from the employer than the cost of the care they give. So there was an incentive to deny care. And they were doing it. And therefore, people were being denied coverage. Uh, and those uh, insurance companies uh, uh, were protected by the ERISA law. So, so that's what we, that's what we, uh, that's what we encountered uh, when we came in, in, in 1995. I will say it was a slow turnaround. We were committed to it. Once in, you have to stay in. And I, you know, in the in, in the in the 20 years since. In the 20 years since, we've gone from a, uh, from a situation of absolutely horrible to only pretty bad. Okay. That's the progress we've made. Okay. But that is that is an enormous amount of progress. And I will say this, the First Circuit is now known as the most favorable to plaintiff's circuit in the country. Um, and there was no ERISA bar, plaintiff's ERISA bar in 1995. Uh, when we started. Now there is a, uh, uh, an ERISA bar, plaintiff's bar in, uh, in Massachusetts of about 20 to 25 lawyers who have stayed with it and really know this area. And they are the, 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 the protectors of, uh, of health care coverage for workers uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Massachusetts. So, so that's, you know, that was a challenge to, 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 to uh, to try to master this very arcane uh, world of ERISA, which the defendant's bar had really complicated tremendously. What, and, and this is my first point about health policy, what those defendant's lawyers had done, what the corporate uh, lawyers had done, is they had made policy. They had taken a piece of legislation that was pretty wide open in terms of how one could interpret it, jury trial, uh, uh, standard of review, and essentially, whether or not this, this thing called the ERISA law would be protective as a matter of policy of, uh, of workers or not, and saw to it that it was articulated as a policy not so protective of workers. And it has taken us 20-something years to try to undo that in various ways by picking the most egregious practices as uh, plaintiff's advocates and pointing out to courts how those egregious practices just go too far and have caused some kind of, cause a, a, a revision of the, the law in that way. So that was the start of things. What I want to talk about now is a couple of individual cases that we had, uh, that we took when we started uh, the legal network, even before we formed Health Law Advocates, that told us absolutely that we were onto something in terms of taking individual cases to try to uh, change the system. That is, change policy through the legal cases we brought. <clears throat> and I'll start with this case. A man came in in 1995, his name was Nick DePompo. And Nick had come, had heard about Healthcare for All, had heard that, they might, he might, that Healthcare for All might be able to help them. So he came and he described a situation where he had shown up, he, he, had, he, he worked for an appliance company down on Harrison Ave. Uh, and, and he had shown up at his, and he, and he had uh, a health care insurance, paid his premiums to the employer, uh, faithfully every month, showed up at the doctor's office one day uh, to find and to be told, no, no, you no longer have insurance. He said, wait a minute, I just paid my premiums. And no, no, we have you down here. Blue Cross Blue Shield, no, no, you don't have any insurance. So he came in to us and said, what's going on? And we investigated. And we called Blue Cross Blue Shield to see what, what was going on and find, found out that his employer 
had taken the premiums but hadn't passed them on to Blue Cross Blue Shield because they were in financial trouble. So they just decided, well, well, we'll, we'll get to that later. We need the money now. And as a result, Blue Cross had canceled the policy without letting the employees know. And the employer certainly wasn't going to let the employees know. So the way that Nick DePompo finds out he no longer is insured is by being at the doctor's office waiting for care. So that was a case that came into our office. And you know, it was appalling. It was, and I'll talk about this, there are various ways we get plaintiffs, we, we uh, advocates, sometimes they just walk in the door carrying a problem we never recognized before. Most often, they come in the door with a problem we were aware of, we say, aha, where have you been? <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and we go ahead and try to advocate to, uh, for change. And sometimes we get the idea first, and I'll talk about a case like this, and we go out and find the plaintiffs to allow us to bring the case as a vehicle for change. But this was a case where we didn't know about the practice. In fact, it was a lot, it was, it was, that is the practice of uh, cancellation, unilateral cancellation policy uh, by the insurance company uh, when the premiums aren't paid, no notice, no provision for alternatives on the part of the employee. <coughs> so this is where being, uh, having had some experience in legal practice really is helpful. So we got the idea, we could sue, but who are we gonna sue for what? Uh, uh, so we went to the Attorney General's office uh, in 1995. Uh, this was actually, so this was a, an, a, a, consumer, a, viol, a consumer protection violation. A violation in the 93A law in Massachusetts, chapter 93A, however, one problem is, I was talking about the ways in which uh, the defendant's bar had, uh, had perverted uh, ERISA. The fact of the matter is, when you have a workplace situation, you can't bring a state consumer uh, protection act case because the courts had decided, federal courts had decided that, uh, that ERISA was the exclusive remedy. And therefore, all state uh, consumer protection laws and so far as health insurance is concerned, were preempted. Not only that, all the cases have to be brought in federal court, which tend to be more conservative, uh, where the judges tend to be uh, more conservative uh, on the whole. So uh, a consumer, uh, a, a 93A Consumer Protection Act case could not have been brought in. So we went to the Attorney General's office because we recognized that although we couldn't bring a case, Actually, the Attorney General's office has rulemaking power under Chapter 93A. And so, uh, in consultation with the, the folks at the Attorney General's office, we persuaded them this was such an egregious case that someone would, be, uh, would lose his insurance to no fault of his own, although paying premiums because of somebody, else, somebody else's misconduct, uh, that the Attorney General promulgated a, a regulation forbidding uh, the termination of insurance in situations like this where premiums had not been paid by the employer without making sure that there was some provision for an alternative by the uh, individual employees who were covered by that policy. So for example, individual insurance policy, uh, one by an individual uh, insurance policy, so-called non-group employee uh, insurance is group. Uh, it, it's group insurance, but there is also a non-group uh, alternative that one can buy, as students uh, may, uh, may probably know. So, so the regulation ended the practice of unilateral uh, cancellation by insurance companies. So it was a regulation applicable to the insurance companies. Sure, the employers are the bad guys, but it was the insurance company that actually brought uh, uh, the injury uh, on the individual seeking uh, coverage. That was a change in policy. That was an important change of policy in Massachusetts through legal action. And I use it as an example of how lawyers uh, can uh, make changes that simply aren't available, policy changes that aren't available any other way because there is no way a bill to accomplish that result could have passed through the legislature because the insurance lobby is so strong uh, yeah, on Beacon Hill. But it was possible through this other 
uh, this other avenue, representing an individual client uh, to achieve that result. Now let me tell you about a second case. I'm going to talk about two individual cases, and then I'm going to talk about uh, two class actions, and then I'm going to be done and hope that you have questions. The other case uh, involved a family uh, named McDermott, and uh, um, Sam McDermott had stomach cancer. Uh, and uh, at the time he came to us, he had racked up $250,000 in medical bills, surgery and otherwise, uh, mostly hospital bills. Uh, and he had been refused, he actually his policy had been canceled uh, by the insurance company United Healthcare out of Minneapolis, uh, saying that the cancer was a pre existing condition and therefore. The policy did not cover uh, that condition. 250,000 in bills. I met the family, uh, the large family, small business, no way they could afford it. And he was very concerned. He was dying. And he was concerned that his family would be saddled with his uh, medical bills after he died. So we took the case. Obviously, we were on fire with this case. Uh, and we read the policy. We read the policy carefully, and it's all about where the commas are placed. You know, that's, that's, that's our work, right? To make sure that the, comment where, that, the, that the contract is read in the way that it should be read, properly interpreting uh, where the commas, how the commas lead us through the policy. And we saw that, in fact, you know, that the, uh, the pre-existing condition clause did not apply. So we thought, oh, I'm gonna have to sue. But here's what happened. Call the, uh, the legal counsel of United Healthcare, got a person on the phone uh, who uh, uh, I spoke with, and we went through the policy together, and she said, you're right. Uh, more or less, where do we send the check? And so it was one of those, we had done the work, we had been careful, we looked through the policy, we made sure we were right, and you know, Wendy and I have done this so many times, we just, you know, are, why, why aren't we right? Spent a lot of time deciding, to arguing, or, or considering why aren't we right, and then deciding we are right, and uh, going to the, uh, uh, to the insurance company. <laughs> this is rare, but this was, uh, this was a time where the, uh, the, the lawyer agreed with us, sent us a check for $250,000. That's only part of this. Here's the other thing. And this, I'm going to draw a contrast between the pump and that. That was wonderful for that individual. He had $250,000 in bills. He had a check for $250,000. But I had learned something about uh, providers, healthcare providers. They charge way more than the cost of the procedure. And as a matter of fact, if the insurance company, United Healthcare, had paid directly to the uh, to the Mass General Hospital, the uh, price, the sticker, uh, the, the the charge would have been forty percent of what they charge to the McDermott's. Because if you don't have insurance, you get the sticker price, which is the price that is subject to negotiation between insurance and the provider in terms of how much the provider gets paid. And you can bet the insurance company is not going to pay the provider the sticker price. So Mass General Hospital, by right, from uh, is paid by United Healthcare, forty percent. So the United so the United Healthcare lawyer uh, in Minneapolis had made a mistake in a sense because she paid us the sticker price of his bills when in fact they would have paid much less to the providers uh, who actually provided the care. So I took the two hundred fifty thousand dollars and negotiated with each of the providers um, how much they would accept. Mass General Hospital, you know, made the plea. They erased the bill entirely. Mm -hmm. They erased the bill entirely. In the end, I think it cost us $150,000 or $250,000. So there was $100,000 that could be handed over to the family while uh, Mr. McDermott was still alive. It was a good result. It was a really good result. He died, actually, uh, I think a few months later. That's, I, I talk about De Pompo as a policy change, you know, just this one case that changed policy in terms of uh, cancellation of insurance. Here was a case where we actually perpetuated the practice in our representation. We changed nothing. 
We change nothing. Today, if you are not insured in Massachusetts, you get still are charged the sticker price. In our case, which is such a sympathetic case, just think of it, if maybe we had brought some kind of consumer protection action that the, there was price, price gouging going on by the providers, we might have changed the law. But of course, we were interested in helping our clients. So that was an example of where we changed no policy. We were individual, we were <laughs> representatives of in, an individual interest, making sure that interest was satisfied. And by so doing, in a sense, we're complicit in a continuation of the overall policy of vastly inflated sticker prices. So both aspects of the work that we do. Now let me go on and talk about two class actions that we, all of these are all HLA or pre-HLA cases. It's what we do is what makes it fantastic. Um, and uh, so one uh, case that we brought was in the year 2000. Uh, it was called Healthcare for All, our client, because we were healthcare for all as public interest law firm, versus Romney, um, which is a, was a case representing the interest of 500,000 children who were on mass health, children on Medicaid, who were receiving abysmal dental care. And here's, a, it's just such an interesting prelude to this. The reason we got involved is because healthcare for all had been trying to improve the rates of uh, dentists uh, who, uh, uh, who take mass health because as a result of low Medicaid rates paid to dentists, uh, only 10%, 10 of the 5,000 dentists in Massachusetts accepted Medicaid. So 500 out of 5,000, which meant, which meant that um, what was an absolute right to dental care for children in Massachusetts uh, did not exist in reality. There was a study done in Lynn, Massachusetts in 1998-1999 of third graders, and the phrase that was used by the dental experts is that they had observed bombed out mouths. Almost all of the children were on Medicaid because these children could not find a dentist who would, who would uh, take uh, mass health. True of adults as well, uh, but there was a, just a quirk in the law that gave us a greater, uh, greater leverage in, 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 uh, yeah, with regard to children. And, and so uh, uh, the uh, Healthcare for All had attempted to get the administration, uh, the Romney administration, to change, uh, well, actually, before that was the Saluji administration at the time, to, 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 to improve the rates, and they weren't having. So we said, okay, well, we'll bring the lawsuit. And there's a provision of mass health, early uh, periodic screening and diagnosis and treatment, EPSDT, which gave us a leg up in uh, suing the administration. But we didn't sue for higher rates because we recognized that court would be very reluctant to order a money judgment uh, against the state. Yeah, it's a no-no. To, to, uh, to attempt to get a court to order a state to disgorge funds. Uh, so, but increased rates were what we were after. Uh, but we couched it in a broader uh, reform policy-like uh, case. It took us five years to litigate it, uh, and we won. Uh, and in the course of all of that, rates went up. Uh, but the most important thing that happened out of that lawsuit, I think, was that the, uh, the department, uh, the Medicaid uh, agency, decided it made more sense for them to simply farm out management of dental care to a private company, which was Delta Dental, which was also the insurance company for uh, many, many employers who provided dental coverage for their, uh, for their employees, with the result that rather than a cumbersome process of gaining minute reimbursement from Medi the Medicaid agency, it was a streamlined process, meaning that it would look very much like the same process of getting reimbursement as a dentist from, uh, from um, employees uh, uh, who were covered by uh, workplace insurance. It, within three years, the, uh, the percentage of dentists who accepted Medicaid went from 10% to 
and it has remained at about 50 percent. And that's not ideal, but it was, it was a big improvement. And that changed the system. I, I, I really think that the, that the, the, the uh, decision, which we negotiated this as part of the remedy phase of, uh, after, the, uh, after the federal court found liability on the part of the state under the EPSDT law, uh, because there certainly wasn't a whole lot of uh, uh, screening, diagnosis, and treatment of, of these children. Um, so that, that, that the most significant change was that, that, uh, uh, that Medicaid simply contracted away the responsibility and brought system change, because that's the way the system runs now in Massachusetts. Would we be able to legislate that? Uh, I doubt that we would have gotten the attention of the legislature enough to do that. And certainly, until soon, uh, the administration itself was not interested in doing that. Okay, final class action, uh, and it's one that's very dear to uh, the heart of uh, Wendy's heart and mine, and that's the uh, Finch versus Connector case. And this is the case that we brought in, in 2009. Uh, uh, at, during the Great Recession. You know, in 2006, I mentioned to you, uh, health reform happened in Massachusetts. We were the first state to really pass a law that made it possible to, uh, to cover virtually everyone with health insurance. The notion being health care is a right, and this is the way to deliver on that right legislatively. We did that in 2006. Uh, that uh, system of coverage, which included subsidies for people who couldn't aff uh, afford to pay, and also uh, subsidies for those uh, individual, subsidies for employers, uh, but also subsidies for employees who were working in workplaces that didn't have health insurance. So it's a very complex law to try to get health insurance to everybody. Not only citizens, citizens, yes, but also uh, so-called legal aliens, a class, a, a, a class of people who were here legally, that is, not undocumented, had documents, but weren't citizens. Uh, and the cost to the state of, uh, of uh, ensuring that cohort of 45,000 people was $150 million. In, in, in um, 1996, I'm sorry, in 2006, when the law was passed, sure, it was good times. Let's let everybody in. Three years later, in 2009, in the midst of the Great Recession, the legislatures uh, and the uh, administration decided you know, that the uh, line of least resistance was to cut legal immigrants off of subsidized health insurance, thereby saving $150 million. So, um, we brought a lawsuit to overturn that decision, claiming it was unconstitutional. But the part that I, I you know, that I, I recover, I, I, I saw, sorry, I recall so fondly, was the process that Wendy and I went through to decide to bring the case. Because at the time, absolutely no one that we knew thought that we had a leg to stand on to challenge this uh, decision to cut off uh, people who are not citizens. Uh, and no, there was no decision in Massachusetts, nothing, that in any way suggested that we had a case. We had to make some first impression law here. So Wendy and I went through a process of three weeks of attempting to prove that we didn't have a case. Okay. We, <laughs> and I remember that we spent a lot of time trying to prove we didn't have a case. And we couldn't at least in our heads, okay, nobody agreed with us. And of course, those are the, those are the most fun cases. Nobody agrees with you, okay, and we think we're right. And we're representing 45,000 legal uh, immigrants. So we brought that case. But now, here's the, here's the policy part, law policy interplay. We brought the case in, state, in the state Supreme Court because we fed, felt if we brought federal claims, the U.S. Supreme Court would simply eviscerate us. So we, we found a provision of the state constitution, shielded from federal review, that we would use as a vehicle for our argument. And uh, so keep, keep this in mind. 
we were asking the Supreme Judicial Court, which by the way, uh, gets its budget from the state legislature, which had cut $150 million uh, and thereby reduced the deficit, which was existing in Massachusetts. We we're asking the SJC to overturn the decision of the legislature which would have the result of, uh, of um, adding now to the state budget $150 million. In a case where people thought we didn't have a right to stand on. <laughs> so this, the reason I mention it is because there are some cases which are sympathetic cases, you think, as long as we can get the judge in the right, sort of in the right zone, in the right ballpark, the fact, you know, the, the sympathetic facts will take us. Not so here. We felt that the the the, uh, the the challenge was for a majority of the judges to feel compelled to find our way, like to say to the legislature, "What do you expect of us? This is what the Constitution says." Uh, and and the claim was an equal protection claim that there was no basis for treating legal uh, residents any different from citizens a decision that had never been made under the state constitution. Indeed, there was only one real useful precedent, Graham versus Richardson, which was a relatively old 1971 case. Uh, and so, so that, but we made the argument. Uh, and, uh, and we won. And the money was restored. Uh, and because by that time, the sympathy factor did play a role because there was a lot of press from people who had been cut off. And so uh, the legislature had no appetite to try to do something else. And so it was restored. And I just want to read you just a little bit and I'll close with this. Um, because this is what we had to persuade. By the way, the, deci the decision in the, in, by the court was three to two. Okay, so uh, one. We won we one vote. Why was it five rather than seven? Well, my wife was on the court, and for some reason she accused us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another uh, judge, who probably would have found for us uh, as well, uh, um, oh gosh, uh, Judy Cowan. Her husband was working, he was retired uh, from, his, uh, from the appeals court and working in the Attorney General's office. So it was down to five. And so, and those are two good votes, or at least one of them. I, I <laughs> so, so, but we won three to two. It was Fran Spina who wrote the uh, decision. Actually, it was two cases. The first case was uh, asked the court to decide what standard of review is this rational basis review, which everybody said is, of course, the case, or strict scrutiny. And our, our heavy lift was to show this is a strict scrutiny situation. Wendy argued both cases in the SJC before the court. Uh, and the court agreed that it was strict scrutiny. I remember that the second case came as to whether or not, in light of that standard, the statutes would stand or fall. And I remember I said it's going to be six to nothing our way. Because once strict scrutiny, we're there. The worry board <laughs> of this of this team said, "I don't know, I don't know." Well, it was six nothing. <laughs> I want to point out, and uh, <laughs> and, 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 and and the thing of it is, the words that were used are just so satisfying because uh, this is what the court decided, and this was uh, uh, Justice Cordy who had been in the minority. He was one of the two in the three to two. But he wrote the opinion uh, the second time around. Very satisfying. Um, and again, I'm saying this, right? this is my, uh, what's the word? My rationalization for, 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 uh, for talking about this because we changed policy. Policy was one way, and because of this litigation, it was another way. Uh, strict scrutiny is appropriate where Congress enacts a non-compulsory rule and the Commonwealth voluntarily adopts those national policies and guidelines that was to include uh, um, uh, legal, uh, legal residents, non-citizen residents. Uh, 
Where the federal government has made a binding decision regarding the treatment of aliens, that decision will re be reviewed according to the standards applicable to the federal government, even though the immediate actor may be a state government. In other words, the feds are doing it. We understand in the area of uh, immigration and all, uh, they reign supreme. However, in comparison, where the state acts, and this is our argument, on its own authority, it cannot shelter behind the existence of Congress, Congress's primary, I'm sorry, Congress's plenary authority, and its actions are subject to strict scrutiny review on its own body. Uh, it is irrelevant that the same result could have been imposed on the state by the federal government pursuant to the Supremacy Clause. In other words, if Congress believed that excluding aliens from state health care benefits such as these provided, such as those provided by the Commonwealth, by Commonwealth care, which was the subsidy, uh, were a compelling national interest, it could have compelled the states to forbear, forbear from paying. It did not do so. And so that was the end of the case. And that's the end of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for listening to me. And I thank you so much, Steve. Um, we're going to open it up to Q&A in one minute. Um, I just have to make a few comments. First of all, as um, Steve, I think as it's clear, Steve is a brilliant lawyer, and he talked about how I taught him Marissa, but he really had just taught me how to select a case and how to be a courageous and innovative lawyer. And whatever part I played and had the opportunity, it's really through his mentorship, and I am so grateful. I want to make two other comments about Steve. Um, or maybe it's three. I don't know how to divide this. One is, having known Steve for a long time, every time we talk about a case, he always, and it's sometimes when it's not a case, it's just a conversation, he's always, how does this affect real people? How does this affect the consumer? What does this mean? Everything that you do is from that perspective. And we're going to honor Steve. Second of all, Steve talked about his litigation, but I think we also should not acknowledge that Steve is not just a brilliant litigation strategist. He is a brilliant strategist of how to create the structures, the institutions, the movements, and the mechanisms that help to institutionalize positive change. And litigation is just a small part of that. At the very beginning, Dean Paul talked about some of the many organizations that Steve, and not all of them, that Steve has helped to found, support, direct, play a role in. Didn't mention the fact that when Healthcare for All needed someone last year, Steve pitched in and uh, ran the organization. I mean, it's not just about cases, it's about creating the structures so that we can be confident here, and I'd like to think about it this way because I just came back from a conference in DC, and of course what's on my mind because I'm a worry board is all of the potentially disastrous things that may happen to consumers, working people, poor people in this country in the next couple months. And we're somewhat confident, maybe even a little cocky, I'm never quite totally optimistic, that we're at least immune from much of that here in our little bubble here in Massachusetts. That's because of the stuff he's put in place. Right? That's because of the organizations, the movements, the partnerships, the collaborations between organizations that Steve has helped to put in place, that has helped to ensure that no matter what happens at the federal level, the people of Massachusetts will still get the health care they need. So because of that, and in recognition, and, oh. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. The Center for Health Policy and Law wants to give this to you um, as recognition that Steve's role as champion for health care consumers, which really is what you are. Thank you. I hope so. I hope so. Some thoughts? 
thoughts, not only questions, but thoughts and Steve, Dan, thanks so much for being here. Um, and uh, kudos to you and your team at HLA. It's been an honor to share. I've worked with you for a number of years. Although my greatest pride is being your first co-op student. At first? Back in the co-op. And so I'd like to actually speak a little bit for those who are not familiar with the first co-op students about the unique role that our Eastern University School of Law has played in HLA and your work on the Commonwealth. Because it's a long-standing tradition, and it's amazing to see a lot of really successful and talented healthcare lawyers coming out of the pipeline of the to build. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you know, we have a fellowship that we call the Wendy Parmet Fellowship that kind of connects us at the hip. Uh, uh, that is between HLA and, and Northeastern. So a, a different graduate every year uh, comes and really becomes a staff lawyer. It's a fellow, Parmet Fellow but becomes a staff lawyer at uh, Health Law Advocates. And it's been great. It's been going on for, I'm going to say, 15 years, something like that, 15 years. And, uh, and let's hope it keeps going on. But it's been, it's been great. Some wonderful, wonderful people have come through. Some of whom stayed, and some of whom went on, as we would expect, to, to do uh, other things. Hoping always that it remains in the public interest. Any other thoughts, Matt? Did you want to? Well, that was my that was my comment. So it just you know, I should say it's been you know like such a incredible, mind blowing privilege to work with Steve and Wendy and Dan in this great organization, um, really doing wonderful things for people. And so um, you want to be part of the, the next lawsuit, the next um, case that's in line of great stories after the dental case and after the um, immigrant case. If you want to be part of that next case, you can have that opportunity. And so, um, tap me on the shoulder on the way out, or just look, call our office and ask for me. I would really love to have folks that are here apply for the fellowship. We would love to have you join our team and, and um, be part of the next kind of great adventure with um, Wendy and Steve. So, I hope you'll consider that. Yeah, and you know, I, I just want to say this. I, I try to stay away from so the, the preaching part of this, but it's my bias. I believe that lawyers practicing law, representing real clients, uh, have the potential to make enormous policy change, as well as help particular individuals to actually be able to see how the results of your hard work has an impact on a particular person, a set of persons, your clients, as well as the policy chain. I think you know, that's, that's hard to equal in any, uh, in any line of work. The other thing I want to say about practicing law, really from the first day, we, well, put it this way, to be, have impact on policy, it takes a lot of study. Uh, it takes uh, I don't know, a lot of drilling down uh, to get enough equipment to make a difference. It just does, and it should be that way. It should be that way. In the practice of law, it takes years and years to get good as a general matter, uh, and one has to be serious about getting good. But from the first day, you can have that impact, representing an individual in a small individual case in the eyes of the world, but terribly important in the, eye, in the life of that individual. You can have an impact, and that's amazing. That, that, that's, uh, I, I, I'd like to think it's, it's unique. I mean, yes, there are other professionals like uh, physicians, doctors, who even in an internship and residency can have that kind of impact. But you know what? We don't have to work as hard. You don't have to spend all those years of education. And out of law school, or even in law school, in clinics, can have that enormous impact in a, in a particular case. I, I, it's, it's uh, addictive um, and, uh, and really important. Yes? Hi, thank you for sharing this day. Um, I'm actually a law student. I'm coming from the public health side. Mm -hmm. And so my question is around the dental case that you presented. Sure. You mentioned that you didn't present it in, um, from a money standpoint. And right. so I'm curious how you did okay. um, attack it specifically. when fighting for equity, sometimes it's not effective enough to pull the sympathetic um, yeah. part straight. Yeah. And so money is an effective strategy. Yeah. But with your example, I understand why money wouldn't be. And so yeah. I'm curious. Just doctrinally, I would 
was, it was hard, even though we were asking the court to do this. But here's what we did. We brought what's known as an equity case. We said that the state was violating its obligation to the children because um, the children were not getting the treatment that Medicaid specifically guaranteed them. And to have it on paper was meaningless if it didn't exist in practice in the, in the world. And the judge agreed. So that was the end of the liability phase, which then triggered the remedy phase. And in these institutional cases, the remedy is more than simply pay this or do that. It's usually a, a requires a certain kind of architecture. It's actually called policy making. Really, the remedial phase of a class action is almost inevitably an exercise in policy making. And so we, and, and, the, and the state is forced to stay at the table because the judge is the hammer to make sure that the state doesn't simply say no. On our part as plaintiffs, we have to be reasonable in what we're asking for and make sure that the remedy is connected to the victimization that has occurred, that the one will, will solve the other and at least in theory, do no more because the court doesn't want to be a policy maker, it just wants to right the wrong. Okay, so sitting down, and it took us a year and a half to come up with a, uh, a system of change, which included, as I said, this third party administrator. Uh, but it also included uh, consideration of a rate increase. No dollars, no particular dollars, it was a process is a process of consideration of the rate increase, which meant asking what's going on in the world with uh, a dentist uh, insofar as other insurance, private insurance reimbursement is concerned. And that process is kind of a daylight process. It, through that process, rates went up. Okay, so the money was never mentioned at all in the, uh, in the remedial phase. Is that yes. helpful? Thank you. Okay. Did you want to ask something? Yeah. So, Working in health law and public health law right now can be a little disheartening sometimes. Um, what would you, do you have a reason to be optimistic about <laughs> I would say, as somebody who does, I consider myself an optimist. <laughs> Let me state the obvious. No year has ever tested optimism in my life. Uh, but yes, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, so I, I think actually these times make it more imperative. If things are good, do whatever you want, you know? <laughs> but when times are like this, I just say, well, why would you, you know, why wouldn't you be involved? Can I get a little philosophical here? My model is Dr. Ryu in Albert Camus' The Play. Okay, I don't know if you know that book. That's a book where the plague took over this town, city of Oran. This was a physician who knew that everything he did would be essentially meaningless, except maybe to help a few people. That the plague had to run its course. And he could have said, okay, I'll, I'll take this year off. Because it's but he worked harder. And uh, the word, the appropriate, I think, noun is endurance. He endured through that process. And when it was over, the sun was out, he knew it would happen again. But that's who he was, and, that, and that's what he did, right, because he was a physician. So <clears throat> that's my model for 2017. Yes? Your stories of policy change are fantastic. What's on your short list? If you went up to Beacon Hill and they were in a charitable mood, what would, you, what would you ask for? So it's interesting. Now I'm in the world of mental health. And for the last seven years, uh, I've really focused on the plight of people with mental illness and how the system really is, is, is so wanting. Uh, so I have a mental health bill of particulars. Just did a report, actually, just published a report. As, as Wendy said, I, I, I was interim director of healthcare for all for eight months. And part of that was to do a report called uh, the, uh, the Urgency of Early Engagement, Five Persistent Barriers to Mental Health 
treatment, care, and recovery, and the search for solutions. And in that book, we make a number of recommendations, both programmatic and policy, as to how to improve the system. We try to, we try to take things that are already in the hopper, you know, and not look to California, but just Massachusetts to say, this is not, this doesn't, this isn't a fantasy. We've got stuff right here that is being considered that if you pass, or administration, if you adopt, will improve the system. So, uh, I, uh, uh, it's health, healthcare for all, hcfama.org is the website, and on that website is that report. Yes? Association of Mental Health and uh, not Massachusetts. Yeah, and I'd be I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Anything else? Anything else? Yes. So I have um, two questions, Steve. Number one is at one point you say you uh, you opened up a private practice um, to do uh, health care law. So how did you sustain that practice materially? I mean, were these all fee cases or obviously family members don't have uh, the resources to pay counsel for this kind of thing. Absolutely. And my second question, Steve, is you also said that at some point there was some talk about uh, replicating uh, the work that HLR does in other states, uh, but for some reason it sort of didn't take off. Uh, obviously, not going to take off exactly the same way, yeah. but right. uh, you know the state really well. You've lived here for some reason. 70 odd years. 77. <laughs> You've uh, worked at the State House and so on and so forth. So obviously, you know, we have uh, long history, long and deep history here. But what were the barriers in trying to uh, develop um, alliances across the Great. Okay, let me answer the first. Um, how we sustain a law firm, which I, I, you know, I'm so proud of it, and I'm particularly proud because the reason the law firm exists and actually is getting more and more successful every day uh, is because of the graduate of Northeastern, Mala Rafiq. She's the Rafiq of Rosenfeld and Rafiq. And she came to work 20 years ago for me. And, uh, and she is the best Larissa lawyer there is, certainly in the world. Uh, and uh, one of the top three in the country, Mala Rafiq. Uh, I taught her and then she started teaching me. Uh, and, and I want to say that, I say, I left several years ago, and then the firm really started to succeed. <laughs> <laughs> no, no lie there. This is not you know, some kind of false modesty. The, 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 uh, and the way we did it is this. It was through ERISA, strangely enough. I, when I started the firm, I didn't know much about ERISA, but I did know that HMOs were saying no to people, and we should represent them. And that some of them could afford something. That sort of was my highly sophisticated economic calculation. What happened, what happened in 1998, I, I had learned enough about ERISA things from Wendy and others. I had an ERISA case involving long-term disability insurance. 
which of course is another benefit of employment. Uh, and a person had been denied long-term disability who was disabled because of some quirk, they said, in the, in the situation. So I brought a case and I said, let's have some discovery. So I was before Judge Young. And I didn't realize at the time, because I was new enough, that you don't do discovery in ERISA cases. You just have the record, right? Because it's, a, it's like a review of an administrative agency. Of course, the conflict of interest is written all over it, but let's not go there. Uh, but it's, so it's, it's passive review. You don't discover the agents. You don't have, do discovery of the agency. You rely on the record. So I made the argument that the record was ambiguous and it had some stone. And I said to, I made the argument to Judge Young, it was only fair this is, that we have limited discovery. And he said yes, and the case settled the next day. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my introduction to the ERISA practice. I thought, there's something here. <laughs> and, 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 and so 90% of the practice is long-term disability insurance litigation against disability insurance companies on the part of employees who have become disabled uh, and who uh, have been unfairly treated by their insurance company. And that is a good practice. We, I, and, I, and I, just a statement of fact, no more about it. I, I'm not part of the firm anymore, just the name. Uh, but that firm knows more about this kind of practice involving long-term disability than anybody. And the way in which Mala made it such a success is she decided that slowly but gradually she was going to win the internal appeals. And because people knew over time that we would sue um, if, uh, if we felt that had been an unfair treatment. She got involved in the internal appeals. When I started the practice, our success in internal appeals was two out of 10. And now with Mom, it's eight out of 10. Uh, and that's how the firm has, has uh, uh, sustained itself. You asked about other states. You know, as, you know I, tried to, I tried to start HLA in Louisiana. And it didn't take, uh, after two and a half years, I closed the door. There are a number of reasons. Part, part of it was my fault. I, I, I wasn't smart the way that I started it. But also, I mean, the larger reality is there are two things. There are a lot of states where civil rights does not have the kind of magnetism, uh, healthcare civil rights, or any kind of civil rights, including healthcare, has the kind of magnetism it has here in Massachusetts. Number two, we are a wealthy state. Uh, philanthropy is alive and well in Massachusetts. Most of the HLA budget is funded by the breakfast, or at least half is funded by the breakfast that we have uh, every year. We're going on the 22nd, uh, and This that's, Tuesday, come. This yes. Tuesday, right to seven. So, 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 you know, that's a big, and, 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 and people, you know, we, 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 it's not, how do I put this? We have a very broad base of generous contributors. So yes, foundations, and yes, some corporations, but it's individuals in Massachusetts who have enough, uh, have enough uh, assets, enough wealth, to be able to spend some of it, invest some of it uh, in us. That's rare, that's rare. I'd say the other part is, we are also a healthcare state. So when you start something like Health Law Advocates, I, when we started Health Law Advocates, we said we want to be, the way we want to present ourselves is that healthcare for all is public interest law firm. Because healthcare for all already existed, already had a very strong reputation, strong positive reputation. Nobody had ever heard of Health Law Advocates because we just named it that. <laughs> you know? so, so there was no brand name whatsoever. But by calling ourselves Healthcare for All's public interest law firm, that made a difference. That got us up and running. So that, you know, plus the fact of what kind of state we are, we're a healthcare state, uh, we were able to do it. New Hampshire tried, and somebody in Pennsylvania tried. You know, these are people who uh, I tried to consult with and help along the way. And uh, somewhere, maybe Minnesota, I, I can't remember, which is a healthcare state. But uh, uh, yeah, it just hasn't happened elsewhere. 
there are other kinds of organizations. I don't want to give the wrong impression. There are some wonderful uh, healthcare public interest law firms. They don't quite mirror us. They're, they're, they're different in some ways. For example, NHL, National Health Law Project, which focuses just on this. We are the only ones that I know of that know ERISA. And by the way, it's not that HLA itself knows ERISA, because you've got to do it all day, every day, and we do it. But what we decided to do was send the ERISA cases out to private lawyers who did know ERISA. And it happened at the time, Mala and I, pretty much doing nothing but ERISA, so we took a number of those pro cases. And then there were others who got involved, and as I said, now there are, there are uh, more, more lawyers, plaintiffs' lawyers, who do, who do competent ERISA work. There are many who claim to do it. I'm talking about the competent ones, just this much of the people who advertise themselves as, as the, uh, So uh, that's the, the story of, uh, in terms of, I think, the uniqueness of Massachusetts when somebody wants to start something. Uh, I, I was fortunate to be in Massachusetts when we talked about doing this. You know, you know, it's sort of like I said, when, you, when we were in the Attorney General's office, you get the idea that you're a really good lawyer as an assistant Attorney General, because you win every case. And then you leave the Attorney General's office, you become a plaintiff's lawyer, and you lose <laughs> most of your cases. And then it comes, oh yeah, representing the state really starts you off <laughs> with an advantage. So, kind of like that. Okay? Yes. I have a nearly really question. So, the first case you described when you went to the AG and got the yeah. policy changed, were there people who had been actually given health care on the theory that someday the insurance company was going to pay, then they later on discovered that they didn't actually have any insurance because the employer had held the money? And what happened to them? Yeah, I, I don't know the, I, I either don't know or don't recall. The, the idea where the provider gives the service doesn't get the money from the insurance company, comes after the individual as a result. That's a great question. I'm sure it happened. Um, but we had one case, you know, we had one case uh, by the throat. And, uh, and this is so rare, and we didn't need to know more. I said there are different ways in which clients come and make reform. One is the DePompo way. You discover the bad practice. Uh, with the plaintiff who walks in the door. The other is you go out and find the plaintiffs. That's what we did with the dental case. And then there's the, plaint, the, the, the client who comes in carrying the case uh, on her back. That was the Finch case because uh, uh, the plaintiff came in to uh, health law advocates soon after uh, the budget had been passed, dropping the 45000 even before it had gone into effect. It was slated to go into effect some months thereafter. She knew what was happening, and she was really worried that she clearly would have been dropped. So she came to Health Law Advocates and uh, took it from So the different ways of explaining this, which cases happen. Good? All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. A very flimsy backpack.